Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Ravinder Kaur. I am Director Professor in the HOD in Department of Microbiology, LHMC. I will be talking about medical parasitology today and the parasitic diseases that infect human beings and how we diagnose them. Now, uh, medical parasitology, as you understand, is, deals with the parasites which infect man and also the diseases that they produce. Parasites are what? They are organisms that infect other living beings. That means that they cannot live on their own, they need something to grow on. Now what they grow on is usually a host. Body of another living being or what is host? Host is another living being in or on which the parasite lives. It obtains shelter and nutrition from it and also it might grow within it or it might multiply in it or it might develop into a more complex form. So a host can do a multiple purpose for a parasite. Now, parasitism arose early in the course of biological evolution, like we all know about predation. Now, what is predation? We have seen over the period of time, there are larger animals which prey on smaller animals, which they kill and eat. So, this is a rule of nature by which uh, nature is going on. Similarly, saprophytism is something which is there over the years, that is, organisms are there, there are so many dead and decaying matter in the nature. Now, that gets removed on its own. How does it get removed? There are organisms which feed on these dead matter, they decompose them and they get them to common elements like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen which is utilized in nature. Then commensalism is another way in which parasites learn to live with each other. That is there are many parasites which live in complete harmony with the host without causing any damage and this is what is seen in nature. Maybe it is a God's gift but that is how it is. Now, parasitism basically means that is the parasite establishes itself in or on the living body of the host, either it is physically or physiologically dependent, at least for part of its life or maybe full part of its life. Now, there are different types of parasites. They could be ectoparasites, you can understand from the name. Ecto means that they inhabit the body surface only. They do not penetrate into the tissues. Infestation by these ectoparasites or infection by these is known as infestation. While endoparasites are the one which live within the body of the host. So, infection by uh, endoparasites is what is known as parasitic infection. Infestation is by ectoparasites, infection is by endoparasites. Now, there are different types of parasites which are seen. Proliferous parasites are the ones which proliferate in the human body. While non proliferous you can understand, do not multiply in human body like adult helminths, etc. Then zoonotic parasites or zoonoses are the ones which acquire infections which are acquired from animals. That is normally they occur in domestic or wild animals. So accordingly they will be known as domestic zoonoses or they will be known as sylvatic zoonoses. Now there are different types of hosts which are seen. They could be definitive host is the one where the adult stage lives or where the sexual mode of reproduction occurs. Intermediate host is the one where the larval stage lives or the asexual multiplication occurs. Here man is the intermediate host like in malaria, hydrated disease, etc. Then there is another host which is known as paratinic host. Now here what happens? The parasite merely remains viable without either development or multiplication and such a host can also help to transfer you know parasite from one to another. So, it can also be known as transport host. Now, you will see there are different types of hosts accordingly different parasites are surviving. Now, when there are some which in their cycle they have no intermediate host, they could be Entrobius, Vermicularis, Ascaris, Lumbricoides, Hookworm infection etc. that is from man to man or one intermediate host could be involved say a pig or a cow or a dog or a flea, bug, snail, any of them and they could cause tinea infections and other infections where one intermediate host is involved. Or there are others in which two intermediate hosts are involved that is between man, there could be a snail, there could be a fish, 
or there could be a uh, you know cercaria anything which could be involved in between a man to man so either there could be no intermediate host or there could be one intermediate host or there could be two intermediate hosts these are seen in different parasitic infections now reservoir host is what it is the host in which the parasite passes its life cycle and which can also act as the source of infection for man amplifier on the other hand you can understand what will be amplifier where it gets amplified or where it undergoes multiplication anthroponosis is what we understand when we say that the infection occurs only in human beings this is in malaria and filariasis that is these parasites do not cause infection in animals zoo anthroponosis they cause infection in animals also man they cause infection sometimes when man acts as an accidental link this occurs in beef tapeworms now as far as the sources of infection are concerned parasitic infection could be got from soil which could be either embryonated eggs in soil which are ingested see some food stuff which is contaminated with soil with the embryonated eggs like roundworm or hipworm eggs or infected larvae in the soil they enter whenever there's a pen they can enter through the exposed skin hookworm larva that can enter if you're walking barefooted in the field the larva can enter into the host skin and cause infection or water water some of the infective forms are swallowed along like cysts of amoeba and giardia if water is not you know um, filtered it is dirty water it could have cysts of these which we swallow along with our food or there could be intermediate hosts in the water like guinea worm which can be swallowed then sometimes there are infected larvae present in the water which can enter through the exposed skin like occurs in cystostomia infections or there are some free living parasites in water now these are the ones which normally do not cause infection but whenever there is a some vulnerable site they could enter through nasopharynx and enter and go and cause cns infection also you could get infection through food again when the food is contaminated with human or animal feces in which case an amoeba infection toxoplasma infection and others can occur or meat suppose the meat is not cooked well enough and it contains the infected larvae which occurs in pork infection or trichinella spiralis infection then you could also get infection through insect vectors that is the vectors through the insects they are transmitting infection from one host to another they could be biological vectors in which mosquito biological vectors means that the uh, parasite could multiply within these vectors and change a form of its development this occurs in mosquitoes for malaria filariasis sand flies in kalaza setsi flies sleeping sickness and redwit bugs and ticks while mechanical vectors that means they do not develop in the vectors but they are just carried mechanically on their you know for feet and they plant from one food to another like occurs in cases of house fly when you can get amebiasis or animals could be the source of infection say domestic animal if a cow meat which is not cooked well enough could, could give you beef tapeworm pig meat if it is not cooked well enough it could give you pork tapeworm or trichinella spiralis dog dogs feed you know sometimes can get ingested if you have these uh, dog you know their eggs could be contaminating your food or your they uh, you uh, you know you're handling dogs so you know your hands or your you know food could get infected with the um, worms of the hydatid disease or uh, you know the just ingested uh, eggs could be taken along with that or cat infection that is cat could lead on to toxoplasmosis wild animals could lead to wild game animals like could lead on to trypanosomiasis or other diseases fish can lead on to fish tapeworm mollusks copepods others which can lead on to different infections then sometimes you can get infection from other human beings these are anthroponetic infections either vertical transmission of congenital infection so or through carriers form so and sometimes you can self auto infect yourself that is finger to mouth transmission like pinworm infection or internal reinfection which occurs in strongyloides so what are the different modes of transmission one could be oral transmission that is through contaminated food water soil fingers or fomites so many of the intestinal parasites enter in this manner which could be either in cyst form or embryonated eggs form or they could be in larval forms or through skin one could get infection which occurs in hookworm larva can penetrate or other schistosoma larvae or there could be vector transmission that is through the either the vector is acting as a biological vector or as a mechanical vector direct transmission can occur by kissing leading on to gingival amoebae 
sexual intercourse leading on to trichomoniasis, inhalation, pinworm infection can occur, congenital infection that is vertical transmission can occur in malaria and toxoplasmosis or sometimes a doctor could introduce an infection like if a blood uh, donor sample is not well looked for malaria or toxoplasmosis and that blood sample which is infected is trans, you know, transfused will lead on to um, infection after by transfusion or after organ transplantation. As far as the pathogenesis of parasitic infections is concerned, they could either be producing inapparent infection or a clinical disease. Now, clinical disease when, say, when it occurs could be an acute disease, subacute, chronic, latent or recurrent. That is, it can either be present in any of these forms. Now, as far as the pathogenic mechanisms are concerned, usually these proteins, many of them are intracellular. So, they damage and destroy the cells in which they multiply, like occurs in malarial parasites, they destroy the RBCs in which they cause infection. Or they could buy enzymes, they could produce certain enzymes and lead on to lytic necrosis, which causes like entamoeba histolytica, it lyses the intestinal cells and the, they can be gut wall perforation, they can be abscesses and ulcers. Or sometimes the worms when you know by being present in big numbers, they could damage and cause obstruction of the intestinal tract, like masses of roundworms can lead on to intestinal obstruction. Or by when they are staying in intestine, hookworms and all, they are feeding on jejunal mucosa, they produce now numerous bleeding points. So, all the time blood is being, you know, lost from these areas and patient can have anemia. Or sometimes what can happen is that the parasitic infection by way where it is can produce certain inflammatory changes and consequently fibrosis occurs on those sites. Due to which what happens is the lymphatics get obstructed and can lead on to edema and elephantiasis as is seen in filariasis. They could also lead on to malignancy, which occurs in liver flukes, bile duct carcinoma, schistosoma, which causes bladder carcinoma. Or many times what happens is the parasites they migrate in the human body and they are carrying bacteria and viruses with them. So, what happens is they can produce these gram negative septicemia or patient in a patient who is originally not infected by these fungi bacteria, but because the parasite is carrying them to different areas of the human body can cause infection and lead on to systemic infection. Now, as far as the immunity is concerned, in parasitic infections, either humoral or cellular, both immunities come into play, but the immunological protection is very less in parasitic infections. Why is it less? One is because the parasites are enormously large and more complex structurally as well as antigenically. Second is most of the time they have an intracellular location. So, they live inside body cavities in the intestines. Some of them live within cysts and these cysts could be protected by capsules which are formed by host tissue. So, the host does not recognize it as a foreign body. Sometimes what they do is they cause have enough antigenic variation within the host cell that the host does not recognize it because it starts looking similar to the host. Sometimes they also form a disguise that is they take a disguised form and again the host cannot identify them. Then there is something known as premonition immunity. Now, what is this? Here the immunity to reinfection is dependent on continued presence of a residual parasitic population. What do we understand by it? That is the immunity will be there only as long as the parasite is also there. So, which is quite contrary to how we normally listen, you know understand protection. Normally protection would be that the parasite is destroyed, but here immunity occurs only if the parasite also remains within the body which is seen in malaria and syphilis. It is also known as concomitant immunity or infection immunity. Then there is can be numerical restraint or they can be topical restraint that is some bacteria parasite infection occurs in certain areas. So, you do not have you do, can't develop immunity against it, but sud suddenly you reach another area where you might be exposed to the parasite and you will get infection because you have not been exposed to it earlier and you have not developed immunity against it. Now, for lab diagnosis of these parasitic infection again we need to get like collect samples depending on the site of infection. If it is causing GI tract infection, you will collect a stool sample. Or if it is causing blood infection like in malaria, in toxoplasm, in um, leishmaniasis, you will collect a blood sample. Or a tissue sample when there is a tissue infection or you are getting tissue biopsy, say in cases of schistosomiasis or in cases of a hydrated disease, others you might get a tissue sample. So, basically what we do is one is microscopy and another is culture. Now, microscopy you do to look for either presence of ova, presence of eggs, cysts, 
trophozoites or larvas. Depending on the different life cycles or different parasites, you will look for different organisms, different types of structures which could be causing infection. And some of them you can grow the also, but very few can be grown by culture, which are amoeba, leishmania and trypanosoma, they can be grown. We have media prepared in our uh, labs in which we can grow them. Or most often we depend on immunological diagnosis. Now, what is immunological diagnosis? Either you will look for serological tests, that is you are looking for antigen detection or you are looking for antibody development against them. Or you are looking for skin test. Now, skin test is done to look for hypersensitivity, which could be either in, in team, immediate hypersensitivity, which is seen in cases of hydratus cyst or delayed hypersensitivity, which is seen in case of leishmania. So, depending on what kind of hypersensitivity you could detect, depending on different such strategies, you can diagnose different parasitic infections. But I would tell you it is a difficult diagnosis to make because many a times these organisms, back, uh, parasites, they produce similar diseases, so they are difficult to diagnose and they take long in presentation, which is another thing which can cause problems in diagnosis. Thank you.